Although restraints are used as a last resort, they may be necessary for patients who are at risk of endangering others or themselves. When they are needed, the objective is to apply the least or minimal restraint. Pinnell uses a three-stage approach to achieve clear objectives at each stage. This eliminates chaos and allows for clear decision-making. Unlike most restraints, the Pinnell system has the flexibility to adapt to the patient's changing needs and to your facility's equipment, protocols, and policies. The Pinnell three-stage restraint approach, when practiced frequently, is able to control aggressive patients in less than a minute with a minimal team of four and without creating undue trauma to the patient. Please note, the following demonstrations are only intended to show the application of the Pinnell equipment. The procedures used to apply the equipment are typical of some hospital practices, but are not endorsed by Pinnell. Pinnell is only responsible for the equipment application. Your institutional policies and protocols will determine the restraint methods. For example, your team may be trained to control the legs using any number of methods. Pinnell does not endorse any particular one of them. The objective of the first phase is to control the patient to the point of getting hands off the patient in the minimal amount of time. This can be an intense struggle where the risk of patient and staff injuries is high. Speed is paramount to getting the patient secured and struggling against inanimate straps rather than the security team. The longer you have contact with the patient, the higher the risk of injuries and death caused by positional asphyxia or excitable delirium. For very aggressive patients, Pinnell recommends working with a minimal team of four. Each member attaches a universal limb belt with a lock. Begin by determining an attachment point that is solid and moves with the upper surface of the stretcher when it is raised or lowered. Do not attach the belt to the bed rails or other parts that impede stretcher operations. The long end of the limb belt allows connections to multiple points along the stretcher or bed. Place the locks and keys at each end of the stretcher so that every team member knows their location. Remove the Velcro covers and place them on the black Velcro patch on the bag. This ensures that the Velcro covers will be replaced on the limb belt prior to storage and washing. Lay the cuffs on the stretcher or bed in the proper position to connect to the patient. The cuffs should be far enough apart that the patient can't reach across or touch them, but close enough that you can link them in the middle if needed. In order to reduce patient vulnerability, the ankle cuffs should be secured close together. Tighten the long strap and insert the pin and lock with the button. Ensure that the button is facing outward to allow easy opening. Tuck the limb belts under the mattress for rapid retrieval and to reduce patient trauma when approaching the stretcher. Place the torso control belt at the head of the stretcher, where the team leader will be positioned. For surprise visits and to speed up application, keep the long end of the limb belt connected and ready to go. You can simply attach the long portions of the straps together and pass them under the stretcher to the team member on the opposite side. For all procedures, adjust the stretcher to its lowest position and lock the brakes for patient loading. The stretcher is now ready for the patient. Warning, the patient should be monitored at all times and the stretcher side rail should always be in the up position. When the decision is made to physically restrain a patient, you are facing one of the most dangerous and unpredictable events experienced in the hospital. You must work as a team, with each member focused on their responsibilities. The team leader is positioned at the head of the bed in order to communicate with the patient. In this position, the leader is also able to monitor the patient's stress reaction by observing facial expression. All other members should avoid eye contact with the patient. They are responsible for controlling the limbs. 
Once the upper body is under control, each team member holding the arms needs only to control the arm from the shoulder downwards. The most physically challenging task is to control the legs. In the initial contact, the legs need to be immobilized and held only until assistance from other team members is available. There are several methods for securing the legs, as illustrated here. Pinnell does not recommend any particular method, but does caution against excessive force that could cause joint injury. If possible, the team leader should position the torso control belt even before the patient is placed onto the stretcher. This belt can assist in dragging the patient to the head of the bed or stretcher. In preparation, the team leader folds the ends of the torso control belt so that it can be easily tossed over his shoulders. Aim to place the white tab at the center of the strap into the nape of the neck. Toss the loose ends over the patient's shoulders. Reach under the patient's armpits and pull the straps backwards. If needed, use knee pressure with your full body weight to pull the patient backward. Once the patient's shoulders are on the mattress, ease off pressure on the clavicles just enough to prevent the patient from sitting up. Use a leverage point to double your holding power. This hold is patient-friendly and requires little pressure on the clavicles. It also assists the patient to breathe by keeping the chest open. Pressing the shoulders flat into the mattress dissipates the patient's energy rapidly and prevents head attacks for butting or biting. It allows staff members to focus only on the patient's arm strength. With only a team of four, the team leader needs to wrap the first wrist. To do so, the leader must first wrap the torso control belt behind the patient to prevent the patient from lifting. The leader can do this by wrapping the straps into a temporary knot or by securing the end straps with a lock. The leader, using Velcro, wraps the first wrist while it is held securely by the other staff member. Unlike traditional restraints, the wrist does not need to be forced into a fixed cuff. The wrist can be easily entrapped by the one-way butterfly Velcro cuff while the limb is still moving. Once one arm is secured, both team members proceed to the other limbs and assist in securing the other arm and then both legs. After all four limbs are secured, raise the side rails and proceed to adjust the limb cuffs for optimal contact. Remove any jewelry or clothing underneath the cuff. Should you perceive a risk that the patient may break the Velcro hold, Pinnell recommends supporting the Velcro with the overlapping straps. This is particularly true with the ankles, where there is less overlapping Velcro to hold very powerful legs. The patient is now secure on the stretcher. This gives clinicians the opportunity to discuss the patient's condition and next actions. If the strategy is to sedate the patient, a team member can pull the short strap across the patient's body to present a still arm muscle site for injection. The second phase is to make the patient as secure yet comfortable as possible while taking away any possibility of escape for patients whose aggression continues to escalate. You want to reduce mobility, prevent outward strikes, lunging from side to side, and buckling of the hips. There is no rush in this procedure. All options should be considered and all adjustments done in a manner safe for both patient and staff. If the patient does not calm down, you'll need to add further security. Two staff approach one arm at a time and pass the small strap over the cuff and through the opposite buckle. The two staff repeat these steps on the other side. They move to opposite positions and grab the opposite overlapping strap to permit a pull force against the patient's push force. Wrists are forced together as close as possible and the locking pin is inserted. If required, do the same with the legs. Be careful of outward strikes. 
remember to remove any clothing from underneath the cuff to prevent sliding. For emergency release, pull on the opposite straps to ensure that there is no pressure under the button and release with the key. The patient is now very comfortable and secure in a seven-point restraint position. The upper body is secured, yet the patient is able to breathe comfortably. There are no pressure points anywhere on the body. The patient is locked at only three locations, with only a touch to open the lock. There must be no pressure under the button to ensure a release. Additional adjustments can be made easily and quickly with only two staff members. If a very agile patient is able to place teeth on the Velcro at the wrist, the patient could tear open the cuff. To prevent this, ensure that the strap around the shoulders is sufficiently snug. Staff can also use the short attachment strap to pull the hands towards the feet and loop around the joint strap at the ankles. If the patient pulls up legs to slacken the strap, there is another attachment strap to pull and attach towards the bottom of the stretcher. If the patient is in danger of ingesting vomit, staff are able to position the patient on their side. Lengthen the upper strap so it rests on the patient's hip comfortably. Shorten the bottom strap to lengthen the distance between cuffs so that the patient cannot pull the cuffs apart. Leave the large utility belt over the shoulders in case it's needed for rapid control. This is an ideal starting point for negotiating the de-restraint tactics. The third stage is de-restraining. The objective is to get the patient out of restraints as quickly as possible without risk. If the patient can be calmed without chemical sedation, not only will this be a psychological benefit to the patient, but the institution will gain two bed days as well. It also allows the team leader to exercise the best de-escalation tactics learned in the prevention programs. The first step is to negotiate a small verbal contract with the patient to remain calm. As the patient agrees to quiet down, an incremental adjustment is made to the restraint to improve comfort. This small display of trust opens a new communication channel between the patient and staff. An easy and safe adjustment can be made if the long utility belt around the patient's shoulders is first adjusted into a more comfortable backpack configuration. The ends of the straps are then locked to the corners of the lifting portion of the stretcher. Caution, do not let the straps interfere with the locking handle. The patient is asked if they wish to sit up. If they agree, they should be warned that any aggression could tip the stretcher. If the patient becomes aggressive in the sitting position, simply lower the upper portion of the stretcher to the fully flat position. This can be done safely by one person. Another very simple de-escalation tactic is to allow the patient to reach their face. Loosen one limb strap, but hold tightly with the strap still leveraged around the bed frame. Again, should the patient become aggressive, the arm can be quickly brought down to its previous position. Similar adjustments can be made at the legs to permit range of motion exercises. The waist belt can be applied to the patient and limb belts attached to the waist belt. Slide the waist belt under the patient. Attach the waist belt tightly to the stretcher or bed. Connect the waist belt snugly to the patient. If you still need limb control, detach the limb belts from the bed frame and slide them through the side tabs on each side of the waist belt. Limb belt length can be adjusted as needed. This allows the patient to roll from side to side in bed to prevent muscle atrophy. The importance of these negotiated adjustments is to create trust between the patient and the staff. As a result of these incremental movements, the patient calms rapidly and is able to be released from the restraints much more quickly. One of the unique features of the Pinnell system is the ability to convert the system from a seven-point restraint into a mobile or transfer restraint. Prolonged restraining presents a high risk of deep vein thrombosis. Walking improves blood flow in the large leg muscles and reduces the risk of blood clotting. 
It also reduces anxiety and embarrassment by allowing a patient semi-private washroom privileges. During the releasing process, always use the torso control belt for rapid control in case the patient takes advantage of your concessions. Pulling back on the strap will unbalance an attacking patient. From the seven-point position, detach one side of the wrist limb belt from the bed frame. This strap is held securely so that the arm can be quickly pulled back to prevent the arm from striking. Then pass the long strap behind the patient and through the buckle located on the other side of the wrist. Pull this strap tightly and insert a button and pin. Remember, when you are in a position opposite the arm that is being released, you are within strike range of the released arm. The encircled wrists are now firmly secured. For patients who are at risk of running or kicking, secure the legs with the short utility strap. The legs can now be detached from the bed frame. The patient then swings their legs to the side of the stretcher. Notice that the patient is still attached to the stretcher with one wrist. Finally, release this wrist and the patient is ready to walk. For very aggressive patients, connect the bed strap to the wrist strap with a button. This prevents the patient from pushing the wrist straps down, stepping out of them, and using the straps as a weapon. If upward movement is a concern, pass the long strap of the limb belt between the patient's legs and attach it to the front of the joined wrist straps. The patient is now able to walk with